All right, everybody, it is six o'clock on my watch, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Sarah Gage. I'm the Advancement Manager at the National First Ladies Library, and we are really excited to have our very first live program version of Cooking with the First Ladies. Um, if you've been following us on Facebook and on Instagram, you have seen Sarah's videos um, as she's cooked through some of these awesome historical recipes. So today we get to hear from her. Um, but before I introduce Sarah, I do want to share a few of our upcoming programs that we have. So throughout the month, we have uh, Ladies in the Lab STEAM activity kits. So those are $15 a piece and they are sent directly to your door so you and your kids can learn about a specific woman in science. And so the kit includes a bunch of supplies to do um, a lab from home, uh, as well as a video, a fun button, um, and other print materials that are really awesome. Uh, so those are available throughout the month. And then next month, we will have a brand new woman scientist. So they're, they're different every month, which is really fun. Um, we also have a virtual legacy lecture coming up in February on February 3rd, and we get to celebrate the anniversary of William and Ida McKinley. And today actually is their 150th anniversary. And so this lecture will talk about their life together as well um, as their influence, which is really awesome in Canton and beyond that. We also will be hosting our next film discussion on February 9th. Um, and in February, we're going to be discussing She Makes Comics. And so that film is made available to everyone who registers. So you can watch the film and then join us for a discussion with a Cleveland-based comic book artist and illustrator on the 9th. And then on February 18th, we're bringing another one of our programs live and on Zoom. Um, and that is our talk with a curator. And so in the past, those have been pre-recorded, but now our Director of Collections and Research, Ms. Michelle Gilligan, will join us on Zoom and she will be able to show off a really awesome item in our collection. Um, this time it's Angelica Van Buren's bag that she embroidered with beautiful flowers. So if you register for that event, you'll get um, a close-up look at the bag as well as the history around it. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for the night. Sarah Morgan has a bachelor's degree in history, as well as a passion for the First Ladies. After finding a copy of the First Ladies cookbook at a thrift store back in 2019, she began a project on Instagram called Cooking with the First Ladies, and she had a goal to cook through all of the administrations. Now she has done that, and she also creates content for the National First Ladies Library, which you may have seen, um, by filming videos to share First Lady food facts, tutorials, and recipes. So without further ado, Sarah, I will hand it over to you. Awesome. Well, hey, y'all. Um, I'm Sarah Morgan, and again, welcome to the very first live Cooking with the First Ladies program for the National First Ladies Library. Um, when I started this project, I absolutely had no idea where it was going to go uh, or anything like that. Um, so um, I also realized there was a lot of first ladies that I didn't really know much about, including Grace Coolidge, who we'll be talking about tonight. Um, I did quickly actually find her to be one of my absolute favorite first ladies, um, especially with her big personality um, during a roaring decade. Uh, so Grace Coolidge really reflected um, the cultural tone of the roaring 20s and was first lady at a time of a booming economy. Um, so um, this evening, um, I'm going to share just a little bit about the charismatic Grace Coolidge and also the 1920s. And then I'm going to share how to make a pineapple salad, which is actually honestly way cooler than what it sounds, um, icebox cookies, and a coffee souffle. Um, so after the program, if you stick around, um, there will be a little time for some questions um, in the chat if you have any. Um, so I'm going to pop over. I'm going to uh, put on a PowerPoint um, and share a little bit about Grace with you. So um, Grace has been described as glamorous, elegant, outgoing, friendly, a loving wife and mother, dynamic, energetic, young, vibrant, witty with a loud laugh and stylish. Uh, in many ways, she was the complete opposite of her husband who was known as silent cow. And she very much balanced her husband's manner with her kind nature and vivaciousness. 
Grace uh, was also very modest and once said, it has been my experience that those who are truly great are the most simple people at heart, the most considerate and understanding with a decided aversion about talking about themselves. She really followed this as well because she actually never spoke to reporters, which also added to her mysterious quality. The 1920s were known most famously as the Roaring Twenties and the Jazz Age, and the Coolidge administration happened right alongside it. Uh, as many countries around the world were experiencing economic prosperity following the end of World War I, the decade brought about several new and exciting social and cultural trends. Jazz blossomed, Art Deco peaked, and the Charleston made its dancing debut. For women, knee-length skirts and dresses became acceptable, uh, and bobbed hair with a Marcel wave was the bee's knees. Uh, and they were smoking and drinking out of porcelain teacups in the speakeasies. Uh, these ladies who pioneered these trends were known as flappers, and Zelda Fitzgerald is often known as the first. Her husband, F. Scott Fitzgerald, described the 1920s in his book, The Great Gatsby, writing, the parties were bigger, the pace was faster, the shows were broader, the buildings were higher, the morals were looser, and the liquor was cheaper. Before the golden 20s, Grace Anna Goodhue was born in Vermont on January 3rd, 1879, and was an only child. She received an excellent education, including piano lessons and exposure to fine music. She was also very lively and a very friendly child who had an active social life, which would go on to reflect her personality as first lady and hostess. Uh, Calvin Coolidge lived right across the streets after she graduated from college. Um, and she would see him in his window shaving with a derby hat on the back of his head and wearing long underwear. Uh, there were varying accounts of how they actually met but regardless, they began writing letters in 1904 and were married in 1905. Grace's mother initially opposed the timing of the wedding because she wanted the couple to wait until Grace had learned to bake bread. Uh, but Calvin actually responded saying something like, well, I can buy bread at the store. Uh, Grace Coolidge and Calvin both enjoyed poetry and that was one of their very first bonds. The first poem uh, that Grace granted permission to set to music was titled The Quest, uh, and it was played on the radio in the 1930s. And it goes, crossing the uplands of time, skirting the borders of night, scaling the face of the peak of dreams, we enter the regions of light and hastening on with eager intent, arrive at the rainbow's end and there uncover the pot of gold buried deep in the heart of a friend. Uh, they lived very simply at the beginning of their marriage and quickly had two sons. Grace once said of their early married life, quote, what matters these trappings if love is strong and life is sweet. Now all this changed very quickly when he was elected vice president alongside Warren Harding, uh, where at that point they moved to DC, lived at the Hotel Willard, and she quickly became one of the most popular women in Washington. Uh, Grace was such an animal lover that she actually found a family of mice in their suite during their time living at the hotel, and instead of getting rid of them, she fed them crackers. Uh, she began presiding over the ladies of the Senate, and many said she had natural charm, and although she was amused by all the social functions, uh, she was very natural and generally unimpressed, but in a fun and casual way. Even when she became first lady, the social events and functions were just as Calvin, as well as herself, wanted, unpretentious but dignified. Coco Chanel is credited with being the fashion icon of the 20s, influencing the shorter hairstyles, and her little black dress was described by Vogue as Chanel's Ford, uh, as it was as popular and available as Henry Ford's cars. Uh, Grace exemplified the flapper style with her sporty thin frame that worked perfectly with the straight low waisted dresses and she usually wore bright colors. Grace rode the Vogue wave of the time with her fashionable clothes and was even awarded a gold medal from the French government for her furthering the modern fashion industry. Even though Cal was very frugal and also disliked progressiveness, um, especially with clothing and hairstyles, he did prevent her from wearing pants even on her daily hikes and walks or from bobbing her hair, but he did dress her in expensive fashions. 
The era saw a boom in automobiles, telephones, motion pictures, radio, and household electricity. In addition to the significant changes in lifestyle and culture, uh, which all would go on to shape pop culture as we know it today. Grace Coolidge actually remembers as a young girl getting steam heat and electricity installed in their home, which made life so much easier. The Coolidges also were the very first couple to light the community Christmas tree by pushing a button to activate the lights since electricity was still new, even in the 20s. The media began to focus on celebrities, especially sports heroes and movie stars, as the talkies took over the silent films. In fact, Grace was also the first first lady um, to host different, uh, excuse me, vaudeville stars and uh, movie buffs um, at the White House. She also screened lots of different movies um, and also hosted recording artists. Uh, she attended performances by Groucho Marx and purchased and used her own handheld moving picture camera. Newsreels also captured Grace at their vacation home in the Black Hills of South Dakota, uh, wearing her sporty mountain gear. Uh, so this is a little short clip of Grace Coolidge. In the middle 1920s, Grace Coolidge is first lady of the land and honorary member of the Scouts. Here on White House lawn, she tries Girl Scout cakes and finds that scouting has sure taught the troopers how to cook a cookie. In 1925, at Roslyn, Virginia, Mrs. Calvin Coolidge again officiates, this time to award prizes to leading scouts and troops. With her are founder Juliet Lowe and Mrs. Herbert Hoover, all three of them dressed in the latest Girl Scout fashion of the day. Uh, in addition to actors, uh, she also hosted Charles Lindbergh, uh, the famous aviator who completed the first nonstop solo flight from New York to Paris in his uh, plane, The Spirit of St. Louis. Uh, so in June 1927, uh, she hosted him at the White House and the party became one of her most famous events. Unfortunately, uh, even though Charles offered to take her on a flight around DC, Calvin refused to allow her to do it because he thought it would be too much of an unnecessary public scene. Uh, large baseball stadiums uh, were built in major US cities in addition to palatial cinemas. Grace, a lifelong baseball fan who also taught the game to her sons while her husband was away in Boston due to his growing political career, was known as the first lady of baseball. Um, and she was just a huge Boston Red Sox fan. She once said, you might not give a hoot about baseball, but for me, it's my very life. As first lady, she attended the Washington Nationals home games, enjoyed a front row seat at the 1925 World Series, and was given a yearly season pass from the American League in a fitting and fancy gold trimmed purse. Uh, Grace would even tune into games on her personal crystal radio set that had headphones. And she would also visit the White House telegraph room as well to keep updated on scores. Uh, in addition to baseball, she embraced the new technologies in general and listened to programs on her radio every morning. Uh, so one of the most important historical events occurring during this time was prohibition. Uh, Grace ironically named one of her dogs, Rob Roy, after a popular cocktail during the prohibition years. Uh, so we are going to pause for just a second and I'm going to share how to make a Rob Roy cocktail. So it kind of just shows to Grace's uh, humor um, about things because of her naming her dog um, after a popular cocktail. So to make a Rob Roy, um, you'll just need either a glass a container or a shaker. And you are gonna take um, two ounces of Scotch whiskey. And then one ounce of sweet vermouth. two dashes of bitters of your choice, as well as a squeeze of orange. So once you have all that together, for about 20 seconds, you're either going to shake or stir. And I'll talk a little bit more about the famous Rob Roy um, after we make our cocktail.
Then what you'll do is you'll uh, take a little strainer, strain it um, over a chilled cocktail glass um, with ice. And use a little orange twist um, for your garnish. So cheers, y'all. And let's get back to a little bit about, more about Grace Coolidge. Okay, um, so uh, Rob Roy um, also frequently appeared with Grace at public events um, and became the first dog to be part of an official first family portrait in 1924. Uh, because the dog was so much a uh, part of the family, the first lady insisted on having him pose with her for her official White House portrait in 1924. Uh, when she debated on wearing a red dress against a blue background, uh, Cal, known for his dry sense of humor, suggested she could also achieve a red, white, and blue theme by wearing a white dress and dyeing the dog red. Uh, Calvin, an animal lover as well, once said, any man who does not like dogs and want them about does not deserve to be in the White House. The striking famous portrait uh, was presented to her by her Pi Fi sisters. In addition to her two collies, the other named Prudence Prim, the Coolidges also had a literal zoo at the White House, uh, which was known by the press as the Pennsylvania Avenue Zoo. Uh, the Coolidges variety of animals included cats, dogs, and birds, one of which her unnamed mockingbird she had to give up because it was illegal to own in DC. And she did not think it would be appropriate for the first lady to go to jail since the penalty was up to a month in prison and a $5 fine. Uh, the most famous of these animals was a raccoon, which she named Rebecca. The raccoon had been sent from a couple in Mississippi as a gift to be eaten for Thanksgiving dinner, but neither Coolidge's uh, wanted to eat it. So that year, the raccoon received a presidential pardon, much like the traditional turkey. Uh, Grace often showed off the raccoon and would walk it around on a leash. Um, and it would also sleep on the president's lap in the evenings. Uh, she was given, uh, Rebecca the Raccoon, that is, a special Christmas present one year, which was a collar with a shiny plate that was engraved, Rebecca, Raccoon of the White House. However, the thoughts Rebecca had when Grace gifted her son a raccoon fur coat that year was never recorded. Uh, now, Rebecca caused a lot of mayhem in the White House and was known as a regular Houdini. Uh, she would escape from cages, her harness, uh, her leash, and uh, would often tear up furniture and clothes. Uh, the chaos continued when they felt she was becoming lonely and decided to get her a mate, Reuben. Uh, in the end, however, uh, both raccoons were given to the National Zoo at Rock Creek Park. Uh, so these will most likely be the last raccoon pets at the White House because it's now illegal to own them as well in D.C. Uh, the raccoon was not the first time people sent the Coolidge's animals that they had not necessarily asked for. Uh, they were also gifted a black haired bear, an African pygmy hippo, and a pair of lion cubs, which Calvin named Tax Reduction and Budget Bureau. Another important historical event was the passing of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote in August 1920. Even though Grace was in mourning after the sudden passing of her youngest son, Calvin Jr., she made a spectacle of completing her absentee ballot for reporters in 1924, voting in only the second presidential election in which women were eligible to vote. Uh, it was also one of her qualities that really captivated the American public because she never let her grief get in the way of her duties and showed courage and strength even in a time of personal struggle. Uh, she eventually uh, wrote the poem Open Door about the tragic death of her son, Calvin Jr. And on the five year anniversary of his death, it was published in Good Housekeeping magazine. And she continued uh, to submit poems to the publication throughout her life. 
Uh, the 1920s was also the era of the new woman, when women began to challenge, um, as they would say, the old hat norms controlling their behavior, appearance, and cultural roles. And Grace embodied just about all of those fads with her love of baseball, her on-point style, and her embrace of pop culture, even despite her restrictions and regulations as first lady. Uh, she became a role model for young women because of her sense of fashion and independence. Although Calvin did not support her speaking vocally on politics, uh, she used her quiet support of issues that were important to her by attending budget meetings as well as Senate hearings to silently show her interests. Even with her lack of public speeches on these topics, her visible support on issues such as women's suffrage and women's education, child welfare and healthcare brought them national attention. Uh, however, her most passionate issue was for the deaf and disabled. Now, for a time after her father was injured at work, she was sent to live with the Yale family and they introduced her to children with hearing impairments. Uh, after she graduated from the University of Vermont with her teaching degree, which by the way, she was the first first lady to graduate with a four year undergraduate degree. Um, at the university, she was also a founding member of the Pi Beta Phi sorority uh, that she continued to be a part of her whole life. Uh, she and her sorority sisters vowed to write round robin letters, which future historians have used to see into their lives and interests. Uh, because she became a college educated first lady, her ideas were valued by many. After graduation, uh, Grace decided to take lip reading classes and teach at the Clark School for the Deaf, where she uh, taught lip reading rather than sign language. Uh, this passion continued throughout her life and into her time as first lady. She not only ended up raising $2 million for the school, uh, which Calvin supported as well by asking his wealthy donors uh, to contribute as a way to commemorate his time in Washington, uh, but they also invited the disabled and the hearing impaired uh, to the White House. The most notable uh, was Helen Keller, uh, which can be seen in silent newsreel footage using her hands to feel Grace's face and to read her lips. Uh, this brought a lot of public awareness to those not only with hearing uh, disabilities, but also blindness and sight impairments. Uh, so after Warren Harding's uh, sudden death and on her first day as First Lady, she said, quote, this was I and yet not I, this was the wife of the President of the United States and she took precedence over me. My personal likes and dislikes must be subordinated to the consideration of those which were required of her. So Grace's time as first lady was just as roaring as the decade, and it very much changed and expanded the duties of future first ladies who would serve in the role. Uh, she participated in many public events, such as planting trees, uh, hosting garden parties, accepting May Day baskets, and continued uh, the tradition started by Edith Wilson and Florence Harding of being honorary president, president of the Girl Scouts. Um, she also had the honor of pressing the ceremonial button at the 1925 World's Fair. Uh, she was photographed often participating in these activities and was extremely popular with the public. Another highlight of her time as First Lady was in January of 1928 when she became the third, only the third First Lady uh, to travel outside the United States during her incumbency uh, when she traveled to Cuba. Uh, Grace also spent some of her tenure renovating the White House uh, due to her interest in American history and antiques. She was extremely interested in the antiques and used her visual skills to revamp the property. She was very disappointed in the lack of original antiques of former first families and went on a hunt to find some. Uh, she also created a crocheted coverlet for the Lincoln bed and left it to become part of the permanent collection, which also started a tradition of first ladies leaving a memento for future residents. In fact, speaking of Lincoln, Grace is one of the first ladies to have claimed to see Lincoln's ghost in what was his old office looking out the window. Uh, one of her lasting legacies was creating the idea to form a committee of antique and design experts to advise on the furnishings in the White House. And during her time, the green room was the first room in the White House to be fully furnished with mostly American antiques. Uh, the renovations uh, included securing the roof and ceiling of the second story, as well as adding a beautiful sky parlor on the third floor. Uh, it was very fitting that she wanted to add the parlor uh, specifically for more sunlight um, as her nickname that was given by the Secret Service was Sunshine because of her bright personality. 
Uh, after Calvin decided not to run for a second term in office, they purchased a home called The Beaches in Northampton. Uh, after uh, Calvin's death in 1933, she continued to focus not only on raising money and awareness for the hearing impaired um, and the Clark School for the Deaf, but also the Red Cross and local charity work. In 1939, she raised money to bring Jewish refugee children to the United States from Germany and also for Dutch victims of the Nazis during World War II. She also loaned her home to the Waves uh, and put most of her furniture up for auction in order to donate the money to the Red Cross during World War II. Uh, she was also extremely supportive of the United Nations um, after the war um, and posed for a photo signing her pledge in support of the organization. In addition to her charity work, uh, she spent most of the time with her son and uh, his family. Uh, Grace also took on new adventures. In 1934, she disguised herself with glasses and took her one and only trip back to Washington as a tourist and was able to go undetected and went on her first uh, airplane ride and learned to drive a car, both of which Calvin had never supported. Uh, she ended up taking her first trip to Europe, which she used her new driving skills to take an auto tour with a friend through the country in 1936. Uh, she also began an autobiography after she realized there was such a lack of recorded history of First Lady's lives in and out of the White House. Uh, so she included some of her childhood um, and concluded it with the end of her tenure in 1929. Uh, it was originally published in a series of American Magazine articles and then over 50 years later was published in full. Uh, she also, again, submitted poems to Good Housekeeping Magazine and kind of went against how she was as a first lady and began appearing in uh, newsreels, but also sound recordings. Um, now, even though uh, Grace had so many amazing attributes and lived such a literal roaring life, uh, she considered herself hopeless in the kitchen. Uh, the recipes that we're going to make this evening, although credited credited to her, most likely, especially with the coffee souffle, came from her housekeeper. Uh, so in addition to our recipes, we are going to make, uh, what were some of the other foods they considered to be the bee's knees back in the 20s? A few were flapjacks, codfish cakes, mushroom toast, and Hoover stew, uh, named after President Hoover. Now this dish is just basically uh, macaroni and cheese with sliced hot dogs. Uh, foods, especially Chinese, as well as Italian, that were seen as exotic during the 20s became popular. Uh, prohibition also affected food trends during the 1920s uh, because many recipes started to leave out liquor from the recipes and replace it with alternatives such as vanilla extract. Uh, the 1920s saw a spike in sweet tooths, uh, which translated to fruit cocktails, pineapple upside down cake, and jello molds. Uh, this also included uh, tea sandwiches, fancy salads such as Waldorf, and knops, which was basically um, crackers with a variety of different toppings on them, sort of like a little appetizer. The 20s also started modern vegetarianism, <laughs> and peanuts were promoted as healthy alternatives to animal meat. Uh, culinary experimentation with pickles, olives, and relishes booms. Um, although during the 20s, ingredients were still measured in pinches, dashes, and dibs, uh, we're going to be uh, using a little bit more accurate measurements this evening. Um, so, all right, um, let's get started cooking. Okay. So um, we're going to start out um, getting our double boiler ready for the coffee souffle. It does take a little bit of time to heat up. Um, so um, we'll get the double boiler going. And then what you're going to do is um, you're going to take your pan and you are going to put in one and a half cups of cold coffee, cold brewed coffee. Well, you can brew it however you want, but it needs to be chilled. Um, and then you're going to take one tablespoon of gelatin, which is just basically one pack of unflavored gelatin. And then you're going to take half of uh, your sugar. Oops. So a third of a cup of your two, two total two thirds and put that in there. Um, and then uh, we'll, once our double boiler gets heated up, we'll start this because it's going to need to thicken up and then we'll continue to add um, some of our different uh, ingredients. Um, so while we wait, uh, we're going to move on and work on our ice box cookies. 
Um, so actually these cookies are pretty easy to make. Um, so what I have in the mixer here is just two sticks of butter that have been uh, softened a little bit. Um, and then we're gonna add in uh, two cups of brown sugar and run that in the mixer uh, for just a minute to get it um, kind of creamed up together. The next, we're gonna take our flour, uh, baking soda, and salt and add that into the mix as well. And if you have um, your recipe cards, which uh, the lovely Sarah at the First Ladies Library made, um, you can uh, use these if you wanna recreate any of these recipes. So once we've added those in, uh, we're gonna mix that up. And then finally, uh, what you're gonna do is you're going to add in uh, two eggs um, and your walnuts. And that is really it. You just get it all mixed up. And then there's actually two um, different options of how you can store this overnight. Um, one of them is uh, you can put them in a mold, um, such as this one, or like a little bread pan or anything like that. And you want to really get it in there, stick it down, and then it needs to be refrigerated overnight. Um, the second choice um, is you can use a parchment paper and roll your dough into uh, like a log and then uh, roll it in the parchment paper and put your plastic wrap around it and refrigerate it overnight that way. Um, just really depends. This makes the traditional icebox circular cookies just a little bit better. So then what you'll get is your dough, which will come out kind of like a little log. And then all you'll do is um, cut them. Cut them into little circular pieces. And I like to bake mine um, on parchment paper. And so I just reuse the parchment paper um, that I used to roll this up in. So, and again, the, the key is, is you have to actually refrigerate these overnight. So then once we get these placed on here, um, we're gonna bake them at 375 uh, for about uh, 10 minutes. And it looks like our double boiler is heating up. The uh, coffee souffle um, I found to be uh, one of the more difficult of these recipes, um, just because it kind of takes it a minute to get the consistency. Um, this is also another one that you're going to put into a mold. And my cookies here are kind of falling apart, um, but I do have an example that I can show you as well. So we're gonna bake these for um, 10 minutes uh, about maybe 12 minutes, uh, depends on, you know, kind of how you want them soft or a little more crunchy. And we'll check back on them. All right, there we go. And as you can see, this is just um, a really thick dough. Um, that again, you will put either um, roll it up uh, in parchment paper um, or a little less complicated in a mold. Now with this mold, uh, you don't wanna grease your pan up or anything like that. Okay, so with your coffee souffle, once um, a double boiler, um, so I'm just using uh, two pans um, that has water in the bottom, um, heat it up, get it boiling, and then your liquid mixture uh, will be on top. So once you kind of get this heated up and the sugar and the gelatin um, has dissolved, um, we will add in the rest of our sugar um, as well as uh, the milk. So we will let that also um, just cook a little bit, uh, for just a minute. Sometimes it heats up a little quicker if you uh, cover it up. And uh, we'll go ahead 
and also get started on our uh, pineapple salad, which again uh, is, I honestly think, way cooler than what it sounds. It's not really just a pineapple salad. Um, it's actually really just mostly uh, how to decorate the pineapple. So what you're gonna do, um, and I did this beforehand because um, I am not good with knives. <laughs> so I didn't want to um, do this on camera, but um, you just wanna get two uh, medium-sized pineapples. Um, and then the first one, you're going to just cut it straight down the center um, and start to peel um, the outside. So once you have that, you can position them on your plate like this. And this is really going now, which is good. And then you uh, will want to take your second pineapple, a little too much water. Um, your second pineapple, and you're gonna cut them into little uh, kind of flat chunks. Uh, then all you're gonna do is put those um, on your pineapple boat, just like this. Now, interesting, um, pineapple, uh, like I said earlier, pineapple upside down cake was really popular um, in the 20s. And that mostly came about because um, in 1925, uh, the Hawaiian Pineapple Company uh, put out a um, contest to see if anybody could submit pineapple recipes and then uh, people would vote on the favorites. Uh, so um, ultimately, pineapple upside down cake was not only the recipe that was sent in the most, uh, but it was also the winner and just kind of became really popular in households across the United States. So once you have uh, your pineapple slices like this, um, then it's really pretty simple. You're gonna take strawberries, cherries. You can either use regular cherries or candied cherries. And this part, which I assume is gonna be a little, a little messy, um, is a, a piping bag um, with whichever tip you choose, but they, they used a star uh, shaped tip um, and put cream cheese in here. Um, so then you'll just take your cream cheese and squeeze it out in between your pineapple. So also during the 20s, um, there was a new product out. Um, people thought it was a miracle thing. Um, and a lot of people didn't know that it was going to be bad for you. So back in um, 1898, uh, Marie and Pierre Curie, uh, two of the most prominent pioneers in researching radioactivity, um, they actually discovered the element radium. Uh, now radium was particularly intriguing because uh, it glowed in the dark. Um, so uh, it was soon used by the United States Radium Corporation. Uh, in order to manufacture wristwatches and airplane dials um, during World War I for the soldiers. Um, so uh, in order to do that, um, they used a paint, uh, which they made with radium, um, and they called that Undark. Um, and they boasted how it was all made possible by the magic of radium. Uh, now, before long, um, even though it was considered this miracle substance, it's sold in pharmacies, um, in all kinds of different forms, radium toothpaste, radium water, um, and people just thought it would cure anything. Um, it really, honestly, it was obviously very bad. Um, so uh, during World War I and the years after, um, dozens of young girls, even teenage girls, uh, worked at the radium dial factories, um, and they painted uh, glow-in-the-dark numbers onto watches, uh, and whatnot, but they would get their paints on their hands, in their hair, on their clothes, and so they basically glowed. Um, no safety precautions were taken at all, um, and they were actually ensured that this was safe. Um, so uh, in the 20s, especially, several of these women who felt lucky to be employed and be able to work around radio began getting really sick. Um, they were prior to that known as the shining girls because they'd go out about town, um, thought they were all hotsy totsy um, because they were glowing. Um, so eventually though, they all started to get sick, um, brittle bones, broken bones, um, their jaws would fall out from radium necrosis. Um, so just really quite the um, situation that they had going on there. Um, it was many years back into the 1930s um, until some of these women began to get um, the uh, 
medical care, as well as uh, payment for their exposure to this radiation. Um, so just an interesting little 1920s story um, of another thing that happened in the 1920s. And actually, um, another little uh, thing about radium is uh, uranium glass uh, contains trace amounts of uranium, which is a byproduct of radium. And it's actually what gives the glass its uh, greenish yellow color um, and it glows under a black light. Um, so I'm gonna turn off the lights and show you how this glows. Um, and uh, this type of glass was very popular starting in the 1880s, then all the way through the 1920s. So a lot of people had uh, the, rate, the Vaseline glass, as they called it, um, in the 1920s. Um, production stopped uh, in, uh, during the World War II time because the government was using all of the extra radium, um, or excuse me, uranium, uh, for the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb uh, production. Uh, so the name of Vaseline glass actually uh, came from its supposed similar coloring to petroleum jelly. Um, and radium is massively more radio radioactive than uranium. Um, but again, it's a byproduct. So these are not harmful. I don't think you really want to eat out of them anymore. But I'm going to turn the light off really quick and see if you can't see how it lights up. Sorry, it's as dark as I can get it, but it's so cool. Oh, thank you. There we go. So then um, once you have your cream cheese um, on here, which mine kind of came out of the top of the filling bag just a little bit, um, you're just gonna take your strawberries and you're just going to decorate up your pineapple. And what? before we do that, uh, we're going to go ahead and add the rest of our sugar um, into our uh, coffee souffle. So it can be also disintegrating. So you're going to take um, the rest of the third a cup of sugar um, and uh, half a cup of, your, of the milk um, and then uh, let that cook up as well. And just make sure you're stirring it and just sort of making sure it's it thickens up because that's really what you're waiting for for the mold. Um, and then also to fold in um, what we're going to make is the whipped egg whites, which would be the last step. So also during prohibition with even coffee souffles and coffee cakes and things like that, um, they were adding brandy uh, in to the recipes um, anyway, just for a richer flavor. Um, Prohibition was also, of course, a very interesting time. Um, Napa Valley, especially the wineries and the vineyards out there, since they weren't allowed to sell um, their wines, they actually would send um, packages. Um, people would purchase the grapes. They'd send them the grapes with instructions on how to make your own homemade wine. Um, there's a funny little commercial that you can look it up if you're very interested in that sort of thing. It's of a little girl and she winks at the camera and is like, my parents are making grape juice. <laughs> so um, pretty interesting. And of course, it was also the time of the skyscrapers um, and all sorts of things like that. Now, of course, it all came crashing down um, on Black Tuesday in 1929 with the start stock market crash. And I think our cookies are done. So here will be your icebox cookies. Again, mine kind of fell apart just a little bit, uh, but I also have made a previous batch. Um, and with icebox cookies, um, you can add in different things besides walnuts. You can add in different nuts, things like that. Okay, and our last step for our uh, decorating our pineapple um, is to put our cherries on. And then uh, we're gonna make a little sauce um, that you can serve on the side. And you just have this really fun uh, dish to serve uh, next time you have a party or if you ever have a great Gatsby party or something like that. Um, that's just a really cool way to eat pineapple and cream cheese. All right.
And there we go, your pineapple boat. Okay. All right, and so then uh, we are going to make um, a sauce to go along the side. It's uh, very easy to make. Um, you're just gonna need um, two cups of powdered sugar, um, one cup of heavy cream, and two eggs. And we are just gonna put those in this bowl and mix them all up together. And that's the sauce on the side. I will just stir this up like this. All right, and then once you've got all your sugar mixed in, you'll kind of have this almost custard looking um, sauce. Um, and you'll just want to put that in. There we go. Um, a little sauce bowl, a little gravy boat um, to serve on the side with your pineapple. Okay, so now all we have to do is finish up our coffee soup today. Um, so, uh, your uh, next step, once you've thickened up your sauce, um, is you're going to want to uh, whip uh, egg whites. So when you use the eggs for the uh, first part of the recipe, um, you're going to want to separate the yolk and the whites. So um, I kind of whipped these a little bit before, um, just because if anybody's ever with them, even with a mixer, it takes just a minute. So um, got them whipped a little bit. And then uh, what you're gonna do is add in um, a little bit of vanilla. And so we'll just whip them up just a little bit, um, just so they get a little fluffy. Um, but they always say to make sure stiff peaks form um, in, your, in your whipped egg white. And then the sauce is pretty thick, probably be hard to see, uh, but you'll have a, a thick, thick sauce. And um, once you get your egg whites uh, whipped, you're going to want to have a mold. Um, and this one, uh, you will want to grease up first really well so that it doesn't stick. So once you've got your egg whites whipped, just gonna take these and mix them right in to your coffee and sugar mixture. And as they say, they say to fold it in, uh, which uh, not really sure exactly what fold it in uh, means, uh, but we uh, will do our best. There you go. And then you'll just pour this into your uh, mold here. And then I kind of like to smooth it out so it'll be kind of flat on the bottom. And then you're gonna refrigerate this um, for at least four hours. Um, however, um, I have been uh, refrigerating the ones that I made before um, overnight, just to be sure that they set up. So if you're wanting to make this for any reason, um, just give yourself a little extra time. And so then uh, what you will get is what looks like coffee jello. Um, so the coffee souffle. Um, I added some uh, chocolate covered uh, coffee beans um, around the edge, um, just cause mine didn't turn out too pretty on the side. Um, and then also uh, you're, you can take chocolate shavings in order to serve and top that all up when you serve it. And actually, although this does not look like it would be good, it's actually very good. 
Um, everyone uh, in my house has tried it and they really liked it. So, and there you have uh, a coffee souffle. So here's all of our uh, recipes that we made, um, all of which are pretty good. I'd have to say that the coffee souffle was a lot better than what I expected. So I just wanna say um, that brings us to the end of our live program. Um, and I will, again, I'll be sticking around for a bit and can answer some questions. And I would love to hear any of your thoughts or anything like that. And I just thank you all so much for joining this evening. And I hope you thought it was the cat's meow uh, and didn't think it was totally bonus balonus as the flappers uh, would say. Um, and I hope you'll tune into the next one. Um, if you want to follow along for more, of course, you can check out the National First Ladies Library socials and YouTube. Um, and you can also follow me on Instagram, which is at Cooking with the First Ladies. Um, so again, thanks y'all so much. And um, don't forget, if you make the cocktail, as they say at the speakeasies, don't get zazzled. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was absolutely wonderful. And um, we do have a few questions for you. Okay. Um, one that came across in the chat was, do you know which first ladies were considered the best cooks? So in your research, what have you found surrounding that? Or maybe whose recipes were more original than others? That's a really tough question. Um, so many of the first ladies really didn't cook all that much, honestly. Um, of course, as I just said, Grace Coolidge uh, was not a good cook. Um, Oh, Lucretia Garfield. Um, I, I don't know that I would consider her necessarily a uh, really great cook cook with her recipes, but she um, made bread. Um, so when I cooked for her, I made four different of her bread recipes um, and she absolutely hated making bread. Um, she really didn't like housework either, but who does? And um, she, she told herself, you know, if I have to make bread, I'm gonna make, bread, the best bread that I've ever made in my whole life. Um, so she started turning out really amazing loaves of bread. So um, she would be one of them. Um, also, um, Barbara Bush had a couple of really like family recipes um, that they would make, especially enchiladas um, and things like that, that were specific to her. Um, so I'd say those, those two probably off the top of my head. Awesome. Um, another one is about your project, specifically with these recipes. Um, how did you come across the recipes? And are the original, like, handwritten recipes still out there? Uh, with these particular recipes here, um, I don't know that there's any a handwritten recipe. Uh, the pineapple uh, salad, um, that recipe came from the First Lady's uh, cookbook um, that I used all the way up until um, it ended at Reagan. Um, and then after that, it was just uh, researching on my own. Um, so this one came from that cookbook. Um, these two recipes, um, really just in my research about her, these are the two recipes that came up that um, she was kind of attributed to, um, especially with uh, the coffee souffle. Um, that one was featured in a cookbook. Um, I believe in uh, Indiana somewhere uh, way back in the 20s. Um, and that was kind of where they said, she probably didn't come up with this recipe. Um, it was probably actually her housekeeper's recipe. Um, with the pineapple salad, a couple of people asked the same question. Is it safe to eat the sauce since it has raw eggs in it? <laughs> it's supposed to be. Um, see, I as a, I was a history major, so as much as I love the project, I'm not like a chef. Um, I have tried the sauce before, and I didn't get sick. But I, I mean, I, I, I know there's a lot of recipes out there that uh, you put raw egg whites and raw eggs in, and they eat them. So I, I'm sorry, I can't say. <laughs> Um, someone was asking for the Instagram information. Sarah's account is cooking with the first ladies, exactly how it sounds. Um, and if you received the email for the program, it was in that and it'll also go out with the recording tomorrow. So you'll have access to all of that. Um, Nicole asks what the earliest recipe is that you found for the first ladies. Uh, that's a that's a good one because um, I'm not sure if it was necessarily the earliest recorded, uh, but, and it also kind of goes with, um, this is the worst dish that I cooked. 
Um, and it made me uh, sort of think that this was not gonna be a good fun project. So uh, Martha Washington, um, very first recipe that I cooked was for her, of course, to start at the beginning. And um, she had a recipe for beef steak and kidney pie. So uh, I drove out to one of our local meat shops. I got the beef, I got kidneys. Um, even the guy at the butcher shop was like, uh-uh, like good luck with that sort of thing. Um, I came home, uh, I made it. I mean, and it was a huge, I mean, it was not easy. Um, and my husband who likes liver and onions, which I don't, but you know, he was excited about it. He thought this, you know, it's gonna be set. Uh, we, uh, uh, we tried it, it was, it was awful. And so that's the oldest recipe that I know of. And I do believe, uh, I'm not sure if it's that one, but one of Martha's, um, several of her recipes, she did hand uh, write, and I believe they have those at Mount Vernon. Awesome. Kind of going off of that then, what was one of the hardest parts about recreating the historical recipes that you found? Uh, probably just because a lot of the older ones, uh, they just don't have, you know, one teaspoon of this, one tablespoon of that. Um, so you kind of have to work around that or look up similar recipes to kind of see. Um, and also some of the spices um, they uh, use, they, they call them by different names. Like one of them's like mace, not that kind of mace, but anyway, that you can use, I believe, nutmeg as a substitute. So I think just some of that, like in some of the old um, terminology and things, and especially the really old recipes, it's just they did not write them down like we do um, today. Absolutely. All right. So we, it is almost seven o'clock. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, everybody. And for Sarah for presenting this evening. It was absolutely fabulous. Lots of people kept saying over and over how wonderful you did and how much they enjoyed the program. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight and have a good evening. Thanks, y'all.